then it was just sort of my friends and myself taking joy in making music again and writing and not not together <laughs> but you know sending files to each other and just sort of strengthening the music community here which is interesting that's tanya donnelly talking about her new project the loyal seas i'm jamie green and this is trading force <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to another edition of Trading Fours. I'm your host, Jamie Green, and this is episode 105. Hey, did you happen to see the Pixar movie Ratatouille? There's a pivotal scene in that movie where the cynical restaurant critic named Anton is prepared to hate the dish he's about to eat, but upon that initial taste, he's instantly transported to his childhood where that very same dish, Ratatouille, of course, made for him by his mother and it helped him feel better, nourished him, and made him feel loved. The senses are an amazing thing, aren't they? For me, my ratatouille moments are usually audio in nature. Hearing Harry Janes makes me smile and think of my dad. The Stranger album by Billy Joel. I'm transported back to my small childhood bedroom and can still see the orange and white portable turntable I used to play that album on. Songs evoke those strong emotional memories. And those memories last a lifetime. It's like an old friend has reappeared. And the cool thing is, you can have a brand new conversation with that old friend. In today's case, hearing Tanya Donnelly sing transports me back to the early 1990s when I first tasted adulthood and freedom that comes with it. Throwing muses, the breeders, and then belly are part of that soundtrack of that era. Hell, if I hear Feed the Tree, I'm instantly brought back to the mighty 90 KRNU on the campus of the University of Nebraska. But here's the thing. When you do bump into an old dear friend, yes, you reminisce some and tell some of the same old stories, but don't you also very much want to know what they've been up to, how they're holding up, how their kids are doing? I know I do. Catching up means hearing how things are currently going. And in this analogy, I wanted to do just that. I wanted to hear all about the current project Tanya's up to, The Loyal Seas. I wanted to hear how she handled all the COVID lockdown, how parenting is for her, and what her plans are for the next year or two. So I was thrilled I got to do just that. Tanya zoomed in from the greater Boston area to discuss all those things. She was great, and I'm really happy to report the new album is great too. So let's get started. Let's have a Ratatouille moment. Enjoy the memories of the past and enjoy this new feast for the ears. Here's my conversation with Tanya Donnelly. I was so excited to get to talk to you. Obviously, been aware of you for a very long time, but I, I really love this new album. I oh, really, thanks! You know, the, so much. I get to listen to stuff. I always put things in my ears when I go out on jogs because mm. it's it's the one time I don't get bothered by people. Yeah. I put the phone on I Do Not Disturb. Thing. Yep. And, yeah. and this is a beautiful album, and um, I, I love it. I love the harmonies. I love just how it's it, it's just gorgeous. And and your two no, voices. Thank you. Your two voices are great together, and they're very, very different. So for people who don't know, the band is The Loyal Seas. The album is Strange Mornings in the Garden, and it's coming out in May. Yeah, May 20th. So was this a pre-COVID recording, during COVID recording, or post-COVID recording? So Brian Sullivan and I met. He w- he was an intern at Fort Apache in the mid-90s. He came on board, and we just sort of hit it off immediately and it was in this sort this time when the offices and the studio were next door to each other and he you know the artists who were either on the Fort Apache label or recording there part of the you know part of the stable of Fort Apache we would just go hang out there you know I mean there were days when Dean and I would my husband we would just grab grab some coffee and just be like let's go hang out (laughs) And so the staff and the artists and the, you know, every from the staff in the offices and the studio, everybody just became extremely close and very much like a family. And Brian and I just out of the gate, you know, I, I actually walked by his desk and I heard, I heard something playing and 
I can't remember if I asked what it was or if I said something said, Oh, that's so beautiful. And it was him. It was, you know, it was a demo that he had made. Of, and from that point on, I just, you know, just took a huge interest in, in him musically because I just, I'm a, I mean, fan. Yeah. Fans the word. I just am a huge admirer, admirer of his songwriting and his, the, I mean, I, this is a word that is potentially annoying, but the landscape of his music, it's just, I feel like you just really go to a place mm -hmm. um, when he starts singing and the music itself too. He's a beautiful composer. So, so we started writing very, we started kind of guesting on each other's things and that kind of turned into writing with each other occasionally. And then when lockdown happened, we had been talking about doing sort of an extended EP and then lockdown happened and we just sort of said, I, you know, we started to say, I think we have enough songs to make this a, a proper album. And so we reached out to American Laundromat and went from there, but yeah, we did in year. It's been years of piecemeal stuff, but then very concentrated during, during quarantine. So yeah. You know, I've been asking every guest pretty much like, how was your quarantine? Because it's kind of fascinating. It's, it's, yeah. uh, I've had people who have said, you know, guys that are studio guys just sit in the studio, like Roger Manning, who, or uh, Ty Tabor, uh, who's like, mm -hmm. you know, my, my whole life is I'm in the studio all day, every day. And obviously the road went away and that was terrible. And there's, yeah. no, <laughs> there's no money right now, but, right. Yes. but the studio day, like my life hasn't really changed. And, and I have people like you, it's like, this was a new time, I a new collaboration, or I try something different, or I'm going to focus on it, It's been really fat. It's almost like a Rorschach test. Like, what do you see out of quarantine and what do you get out of it? Right. Yeah. And I did. I mean, I have to say, much like yourself, I an extremely incredible, just like such a productive time for me. I collaborated with a ton of people. I finished up projects I'd been focusing on. But, you know, also to your point that there was no live interpretation of that. It, it was a, there was a, just this missing chunk of the cycle, which was odd. And so a lot of things sat and now everything is sort of coming to light. Yeah. It's almost a little piece at a time, but yeah. The first time that many people got to stop and almost a meditative thing, you know, you actually be okay with yourself. Yeah. Cause yeah. if you're, if you're running around a million miles a second, you don't really have to think about those kind of things, but we all had, I mean, besides that or making sourdough or, you know, watching stupid <laughs> things like Tiger King, a lot of time to be introspective and kind of think about yourself and what's going right. on in your life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and, and just, it, it shifts, it shifted purpose for me, which I like, or I should say it drained purpose from it for me, which was a healthy way to be writing again, to have that, cycle snipped then it was just sort of my friends and myself taking joy in making music again and writing and not not together <laughs> but you know sending files to each other and just sort of strengthening the music community here which is interesting you know absolutely you know I, I tell people this too because you and I are both Gen Xers so we're old enough to remember could you imagine mm -hmm. if this happened like in 1978 Oof. when there wasn't an internet Oof. Right. I would have, I know I, I tell my, my teenage daughter, I have two and the older one actually did come home for quarantine as well. But my younger daughter, I just would t just daily throw, throw positive energy at her and, you know, completely acknowledge that had this happened when I was her age, I would have been literally crawled out the window. I would have climbed out the window. You know, it's, I just don't think I would have been as would have adhered to the, to the rules and been as respectful of them as she was. And I hate to admit that, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, totally. I would have been terrible. <laughs> I would have been really, <laughs> I would have been a giant pain in the ass. Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> to everyone. Yeah. That's too funny. Well, you talked about, uh, and you, you hesitate about landscape, but that's interesting that you bring that up because uh, this is like this weird, you have these like weird coincidences and you're like, why are all these things like I've never had like happen. And then a bunch of them happen in the world. So you're the, the silver Lake tune. That's, that's one where 
that's a landscape, but that's a neighborhood in Los Angeles. And this has come up in my yeah. podcast like five different times. So you Silver guys... Lake has? Hmm? Silver Lake has? Or... Well, just so um, Jason Faulkner, interview him in Silver Lake. We talked a little bit of Silver Lake. Mm-hmm. Um, Thomas Walsh, uh, he is his last album, not last album, three or four albums ago that he actually did with Jason Faulkner. It's called Silver Lake. And he's on my list. I'm actually talking to him soon. Oh, cool. um, somebody else in LA, it came up in LA. And then, so when you guys, so I wasn't expecting this, Tanya, because you guys are Northeast people. You're not California people. So Brian's in, Brian is in California. He is in California. Um, he okay. is. He's moving. He's moving back, but he's been out there for, for many years. Well, this makes Um, a lot more sense now. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And it's sort of, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, the narrative is somewhat invented, but it also pretty strongly nods to sort of a mass exodus out of Boston to LA that happened with a, you know, pretty good chunk of people in our, in the Boston community scooted over to LA (laughs) in the late nineties, early two thousands and all landed in Silver Lake because that was sort of the, it it wasn't the Mecca yet at that point, but it was where people could afford to be. And it, it sort of just ended up being, you know, where a lot of musicians landed. So, so that's, yeah. So there is a, you know, there's historical resonance for us there, which is why, which is why he uses that specific area. Well, I should have, I should have done more research on him. I'm a schmo. Like we don't talk no! about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you just did Jack Kerouac festival? Am I getting this correct? Did I get this right? We, yeah. Town and city festival in Lowell. I, th- yeah. I, I think that it's, I think the subtext is that it's Kerouac, but it's not really, there is a, there's, there's a festival that's very much about Jack. That's sort of more literary and music combined. This one is town and city festival, which obviously if you're playing Lowell, it's Jack's going to be a focus. So yeah, all of the interviews around it were, were very focused on what he meant to people before, before the festival. It's interesting because musicians, and obviously he's very much out in the, the public domain and people know about oh, yeah. musicians, especially. And I don't know if it's his peripatetic life because he was always traveling and musicians travel. I don't know if it's because it's the whole beat generation thing, but he seems to resonate with a lot of musicians. Do you have any thoughts on why? I think for both of the reasons that you just described, that's exactly what I was going to say is that it's um, a traveling life. His The beats, I mean, there's... DNA from the beats that ran through everything that happened musically here, I believe, particularly West uh, East coast. His, you know, he has that whole scene had an, had an impact that remains to this day. There's there's a strong, I don't want to say rebel context with, well, I guess it was rebel because it's where the revolutionary war started, but uh, (laughs) kind of a question of authority, whether it's the row, whether it's, uh, you know, there's a ton of that in the, in the Boston area, you know, the, the Sam Adams of the world, they were revolutionaries and they were radical at the time. And it seems like it's been a yeah. theme for that part of the country for a very long time. Absolutely. I mean, the, the transcendentalists alone, just the impact that they had on our culture. I think that a lot of people don't really understand how fundamental that was to to where this country moved for a while, you know, the direction of this country moved in for a while. Um, and that all happened here. So the Alcott's yep. and Thoreau and Emerson yeah. and yeah, those people just, I mean, from, from the arts to abolition, it's, there it was a really intense pivotal moment here. Yeah. It's really, it's really cool. Yeah. I, I was, it some, really is. Somebody who grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska, we had uh Willa Cather. Yeah. And Willa Cather. <laughs> <laughs> that's a bit, that's a good one though. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, Marie Sandoz and stuff, but you know, uh, mm-hmm. it's just, it's just, I'm always, I'm a huge history nerd and I love, you know, like Victorian homes and I love, I, I mean, I'm way into American history. So I always, I was just like, Oh, that's so cool that you would live in an area that would have that much history and also such impact. You know, we're watching the Julia show right now. My wife and I, 
Uh huh. Even like that, WGBH has had a huge impact, whether it's, you know, Julie Child, whether it's this old house, whether, I mean, there's, yeah. been, there's cool stuff that's happened. Well, in let me just tell you the two things that you just mentioned. The house that I live in now was um, Tom Silva's from this old house. Get out this of is town. His child, this is his childhood home. And he sort of did a ton of the renovations that we benefit from now. And we used to live across the street from Julia Child when we lived in Cambridge, too. So How was that? What's that? How was that? Oh, it was amazing. That's so did amazing. you see her I out? Her. Like, oh, was- yeah. We did. She, I mean, she, towards the end of our time in that neighborhood, she was mostly in indoors. That was when she, she was filming from inside her kitchen, the kitchen that's now at the Smithsonian. Um, mm-hmm. She, yeah. So, but we would see her at this local market, Savinars. We would see her, I would sort of peek into her cart and it was everything that you would expect, butter and wine. And <laughs> yeah, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> red meat <laughs> oh my goodness oh, it's yeah. so cool you know um i'm gonna sound like an old fart but i don't really care but i kind of feel like we're the last generation that had all those shared exp- experiences because there was only three channels there was only yeah. you know so we all watch yep. you know my mom had julia child on every week yeah. when i when i first moved out of my parents house my first house i couldn't afford cable and I watched this old house every week because it yeah. was on TV and I had the channel. Yeah. It's just, you know, now there's so many great. So you know, 10,000 different things. There's no like share that shared experience. Right. It's just kind of, yeah, I think they find it. My kids have, my kids have, there's a selection process now. I think that they go through to, to sort of find that kinship with, with people, with their, with their people. Yeah. My kid, my older uh, son is like this huge TikTok person. Like he's just like all uh, over there. Did your kids right. do it at all? Um, I don't, I know that my older does, my oldest does, does not. She's not very, she's not really online. You know, she's not sort of a social, yeah. she's not on social media. She's not, she's, you know, <laughs> my, young, my younger son. We actually used to call her Louisa May because she was, <laughs> when she was little, we were just like, wow, where are you from? She was like, just this little uh, sort of anachronistic little kid who who was obsessed with Concord, always wanted to go out there and go to the Alcott house and to the sit in the barn and go to Walden. And so we used to call her, we were just like, who is this old soul? <laughs> That's how my younger kid is. And she's like that to this day. The younger one, my younger daughter is more interested in, t- you know, she's, she's more of an observer than a participant, but she does follow tiktokers and she's yeah. interested you'll like yeah. come up and tell me like dad i got five hundred thousand people to watch my tiktok and i'm like okay, good I don't, god i don't like i don't even know what that does that good? I, yeah no, i don't know, yeah, I know. Like, exactly it's like i know you don't want me on tiktok because it'll instantly make it uncool so i'm not doing it so it's oh yeah um, yeah i'm i am banned <laughs> yeah right uh I'm definitely not allowed to do that so as a parent because i obviously have two i have a 20 and a 17 year old um mm-hmm. and so what do they think about you? Like, are you cool because of it? Or they just like roll their eyes and be like, Ugh, mom, how do they take it? Oh, somewhere in between that there, there are normal, you know, pushbacks, which, but nothing really that involves, they, they enjoy, they really like the music, which is nice. They like coming to shows. They enjoyed touring, you know, when that was happening and they came along, they are very, they, both of them, are interested in, you know, talking about lyrics. And so there's definitely, I wouldn't say there's any eye rolling around it. That being said, they will pass on a show if there's something more interesting going on in a second. Um, So it's, it's a good, it's a good balance. They're pretty, they're pretty cool about, about everything. We're really lucky because they're interested in what we do, but they're not necessarily blown away by the whole thing you know they're 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 they have they're pretty low pretty level-headed people and they have deep tissue interests of their own so that's which is that's great kind of, yeah yeah well the reason why i ask yeah. is that uh my younger son thinks it's cool that i play guitar and stuff and my older son he rolls his eyes and it's like oh your dad band <sighs> why is your dad band always rehearse here like he's like that's what his thing is so it's just funny but the thing is with him is we've totally bonded he doesn't like newer music he loves 
90s music. He loves 70s music. He, he had my father-in-law took him to go see America. And I was like, how was that? And he was like, it was like old people in their 70s. And he was like 15 at the time. It's cool. Wow. It's just interesting. Yeah, yeah. So we bought, I've took him to see Soundgarden before the unfortunate losing of Chris Cornell, uh, mm. Paul McCartney, Billy Joel. We yeah. just went and saw Living Color last summer, which was oh, phenomenal. Oh, yeah. That's, and this is one thing that I have to say is just, I feel like my kids, I can't speak for, for, for every, everyone in their generations, but I will say that they and their friends have such a comprehensive knowledge of music that just seems native in some ways, you know, they just listen to their, their musical tastes span generations and without any sort of, I don't know, they don't categorize the way that, I was raised to, it, it, it's just, they like that song or they don't like that song. It's, right. you know, that's really the only prerequisite for listening for them, which is so cool. And it also does mean that you get to go to like shows with your kids. You would never think that they'd be interested in. Yeah. It's so fun. That's been wonderful. It's been one of the coolest yeah. things about being a parent, Yeah, so, but we're here to talk about your creative process. So oh, yeah. I, I'm curious when you, talk about your writing process. Is it, is it just, are you a grinder? Like I'm sitting down and I'm just going to, until something comes together, is it more, I'm in the shower and I have a kind of an epiphany moment. What, how does it work for you? A little of both. I definitely, when I'm collaborating, I tend to be more of a grinder because that's, there's someone else involved that you're responsible to. And there's also usually a deadline (laughs) for those. And I am a crammer. I'm a total crammer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which was something that used to stress me out. And now I just feel like that's just how I do it. And it's, you know, I just embrace it now. But then, yes, I still do get the th- writing things down quickly on a napkin moments also. So a little bit of both. So when you write it down on the napkin, can you remember the melody that's in your head too? Or do you have to write down like A minor to F or how do you do that? Because I feel I like sometimes- I remember I... melodies. Do you? That's great. Yeah, that's, yeah, words- in fact, I usually remember words too, for the most part when I'm writing. And then as soon as something is recorded, it leaves my, <laughs> leaves the file cabinet for some reason. I don't know why. That, There's only so like, much I'm, shit you can keep up in your head. I know. Yeah. I've firmly become one of the, uh, one of the music stand generation. I have a stand in front of me at every show. There's nothing wrong with that. That's yeah. great. I, you know, my kids sometimes will ask me like, who'd you have for sophomore English? And I'm like, I don't know. That was 37, 38 years ago. <laughs> Why don't you remember that? And I was like, because a lot of shit's yeah. happened since then. Yeah, I, only- I have a yeah, lot of information competing yeah. for uh-huh. space. Yeah. Yeah. My RAM <laughs> file that is my brain is pretty full up right now. I- <laughs> yeah. So with Brian, since he was he out in California when you were collaborating on, on the Loyal Seas, this new album, or had he come back yet? No, he was out in California at that point. He came back on. So we were together in the same room at on Cape Cod. We went to Cape Cod for a week to mix at Brick Hill Studio, which is John Evans' studio. John Evans, who is Tori Amos's bass player, Sarah McLaughlin's bass player. He's on tour with Tori right now. And he also owns this beautiful studio in Orleans on the Cape. And so we, it's where I made the uh, album with the Parkington sisters also a couple of years back. We finished that album. I think it's, it was like five days before lockdown or something like that. But it's, it, so we went in with John to mix and just sort of pull everything together and make sure that it had coherence. And the Parkingtons played on a couple of things and John played on some of it. And we've re- sang a bunch of stuff and just sort of that, I think that that brought everything that was the gelling moment was, was that week, but that's the only time that we were in the same space for, for this, the end of that project. So, so for the, the rest of it, was it a, a drop, you know, zooming or drop boxing or how did you guys collaborate? A little bit of both D- drop boxing, the stuff that we had a lot. So there were, there are probably there are three or three songs I think on there that had been, recorded before like years before okay and we just did some tweaking on those but yeah brian just record brian just gets 
the most beautiful sounds in his house. I don't know how he does it, but he, his, the comp, you know, the composition piece of this is, is Brian. And he, so he played, he went, you know, found musicians on his coast to add to things. And I found some musicians here to add to things, to add to some songs. And then a lot of that, a lot of it is done at home, both of our homes, and then brought it all together with John Evans. But yeah, it's Brian's just like an extraordinary player, composer, producer. A lot of the sounds on there are, are him. That's great. Yeah. It's been interesting. So talented. Listening to you guys, it's almost like, and you can tell me I'm completely wrong, but I almost, and and obviously it's not blues music, but that, like that call and response where like Mm. he he has kind of a phrase or a couple phrases and then you kind of answer it or vice versa, depending on the song. Yeah. Uh, It's, that's a cool vibe. It is. And it was, you know, I feel like because we're so close, he really is my brother from another and it, he, that call and response comes really naturally. Like he'll sing something and I know exactly where he's going. We sit basically with very few exceptions, maybe none. We sing what we wrote on the album and had input into each other's lyrics a little bit, but, but yeah, I love that too, that he, you know, because, because and Silver Lake especially I think is a good example of this where he had he sent me what he's singing and and I was sort of like all right I know what this story is and I know exactly what the what the other voice needs to say in response and it's so fun I mean that's a an underappreciated word the word fun yeah <laughs> and it was just so fun writing these songs with him it just brought me so much joy even the ones that aren't particularly joyful brought me joy <laughs> yeah I think the greatest thing about music is the collaborative component of it mm-hmm. me too yeah and it took I mean it takes uh, it's really my biggest piece of it when when people whenever I get asked the question what would you say to young artists now open your heart to collaboration is one of my biggest pieces of advice because if you can bypass the grasping of intellectual property, years that happen and cause so much damage and pain. <laughs> if if you could, if that could just be circumnavigated, oh, there's so many bands that would still be together. There's so much music that would have been made. You know, it's grasping is such a, such an ugly and dangerous stage. I don't know, perhaps necessary. I, I don't know, but that's, I mean, collaborating to me is what it is what it's all about. It's the nature of music. I just think it, it just is this, you, you remember when you said landscape, you don't want to, I, I don't want to use this word, but it. Just, nope. I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to own it because okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna feeling use, better I'm, about it. Now. <laughs> I'm going to use synergy, which I hate in my day job, but there is a really cool like synergy that. when you have two people <laughs> with strong points of view who mm-hmm. are great on their own and do really cool things. And then, but when they bring it together, it's like, it puts this whole different new dynamic to it. It like mm-hmm. ele- elevates it. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, I, I you yeah. know, nothing is more fun to me than to play with different musicians and get to hear what they're doing. And cause a lot of, you learn something every time you do that. You Right. And it's, it's music is language. It's language. Yeah. And that's, it works better when you're actually using it with more than one when it's not an echo chamber no, it's it's, so, uh, yeah. it's it's so true it's interesting when you're talking about the business such so can i can i tell you something i love about you and, and your your bandmates of belly uh yes. the fact that you have delete spotify still up on your <laughs> yeah i mean spotify yep. is just an evil horrible <laughs> entity I, I i i think we can agree upon that yeah i mean the heartbreak of of Spotify and other streaming companies, let's be real, is that it's just potentially the most elegant and perfect model. And the fact that there's greed that just, you know, muddies that water is the sad thing about it because it's like those, you know, it's a such an such a useful and smart tool and so inclusive potentially. And so the fact that once again, artists get screwed. It's just heartbreaking because it could be this like beautiful socialist model. <laughs> totally. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, as but, long as there's been musicians, there's always some jackass business guy with a ledger mm-hmm. who's, who's tr- trying to screw him out of money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Everything. I know. It's yeah, and it's. T- I mean, you can trace this clearly. This is. This goes directly back to to ma- the majors, um, but. Well, and I, I'll just wrap up with this. The thing that bothers me the most, and I, you know, I have a podcast, obviously, but I'm not. Uh, as we we discussed early on, I'm a schmo with the show. They'll pay. <laughs> they'll pay Joe Rogan. They'll pay the podcasters. So it's not like they're against like giving people money for what's their intellectual property, but for some reason, it's just the musician side that they have an issue with, and the, yeah, that's what screw over. That's what bothers me. Right. There's, there's just not. Yeah. This equal. There's not an equal side to it. Yeah. And I mean, not to be simplistic, but I think a big, huge piece of this is taking advantage of the fact that artists would do it anyway. Artists would make art anyway. Uh, Musicians will always make music. Songwriters will always write songs. And so there's a huge advantage taken of that. And that's been the case forever you know, unfortunately. So, and in other media too, you know, all, all art forms really. Yeah. Uh, Anyway. Well, I'm here in Kansas city. I know you've played here a ton. Do you have any good Kansas city memories before I let you head back? I love, I mean, it's been a long time since I played there, to be honest. Muses, I will say the muses years, Kansas city was one of our favorite places to play. And just always, I always just felt like, like play, you know, there was this, there was this sort of that area, like Lawrence and Kansas city. And there were these beautiful towns where people just came out in big numbers, you know, like it would be this just and hardcore real music scholars almost. (laughs) You know, it was, there was, I always felt like it wasn't just um, a casual fan. I'm not going to compare it to, to where I am because that's not fair, but but like, it wasn't just, yeah, exactly. It didn't feel casual. It felt passionate always. Well, I, I, I have a theory about this and, and maybe you'll agree and maybe you'll disagree, but I really feel like our generation, we get shit on a ton because, you know, we're, nobody talks about us it's all you know mm-hmm. the millennials versus uh baby boomers and we're in between but I, from a music standpoint i think we had it great because we are old enough to remember the old paradigm with albums and that visceral getting a new album and all that and all that great music that we grew up with and then we got mm-hmm. to see the music become you know it became something that was shared in a completely different format and yep. music changed so much and time so I kind of feel like in a lot of ways, it was kind of a perfect time. If you're a music lover, we got to experience so much and see so much and see so many cool changes. Now, the business side sucked, as we just talked yeah. about. Yeah. But from an, an artistic standpoint, so many, so much great stuff came out. Yeah. And just like, just also the 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 importance and excitement of college radio also. Oh, my God. Just what an amazing network it, that, you know, just the safety net, not even safety net, the uplift of, of college radio was just really a phenom. If you think about it, like, you know, I think about now just the dedication and work and outreach that, that had to go into that network, you know, and that involved the listeners too. You know, we, you just, our generation, I think, actively found what they wanted to, you know, we would just look for it. And instead of having it wash, wash over us, it was less of a process of editing what was coming in as it was, uh, you know, just excavation. It was so mm. exciting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I Just walking to- into a music store and talking to the people that worked there and flipping through racks and, it's just very exciting. Yeah, I I talked to I had Matthew Sweet on, and this was like it almost felt. Oh, like I love like, him. He's from my hometown. We went to the same high school. It's just he's it's a, crazy. Uh, yeah. super nice, super nice guy, super sweet. yeah. But we were talking about like it was like college radio was like the super kind of a cool club, like the cool kids. 
you know, we weren't listening to what, I don't know what would have been out then. I wasn't the listening. The cool, to, not cool kids. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't listening to Poison. I wasn't listening, you know, I wasn't listening yeah. to that, that crap. I was listening to right. like Nirvana's Bleach. I was listening to stuff yeah. that, you know, uh, Jellyfish. I was a huge Jellyfish fan. I was listening to, uh, you know, stuff that you were doing, mm-hmm. stuff that a lot of people were doing. And, and it was, it was like this cool little, I, I love working in the college radio station because I felt like I got to, you know, stuff ah. that gets sent to us all the time on a CD. And you like, I know nothing about this band because there's not the internet. And I'm just going right. to put it, put it on and listen. Totally, yeah. totally objective. Like there hasn't been a PR person throwing things at me and telling me, is this good or bad or why I should care? It's just, what does it do to me? How do I, how do I react to it? What do I feel? It was cool. right. It was. And just in the connective tissue from once from the, with that the stations all have with each other too, you know, just in terms of sharing new stuff and being in touch with each other. And, and like back then we would just, I mean, we would end up, we'd go do interviews in a college radio station. We'd stay at their house that night and we'd end up forming friendships and that would lead to the next town that we went to. It was just such a, such a, it just felt more connected. I don't know. Touring then just felt, you know, it wasn't like, it just felt there was like a connection to the next place you were going mm-hmm. back then, you know, it wasn't no. quite as nomadic feeling in a way. I don't know how to describe it, but no, it, it was like a tribe almost like that mm-hmm. just felt mm-hmm. like you were, you know, it wasn't your family, but there was just this group of people that had this connection that you all yep. resonated with on the same. Level. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. I could talk to you all day, but I want to be very cognizant of your time. So for people that are hearing this, they're like, Hey, this is so great. Tanya's got new music out. Are you, what's, mm-hmm. what's the best way to follow you in 2022? Oh my goodness. Well, for this d- focusing on this album and this project loyal sees Brian runs the Instagram. I run the Twitter and that's, and then through American La- laundromats, Twitter and Facebook and website and Instagram. So for this project, we are pretty involved in the socials. And then I personally am not always very active on socials, but I try to be. So I, I am there. I am there. <laughs> How present I am is is has to do with that's week to week. Yeah. <laughs> so do you know what what's the rest of your 2022 looking like? What do you what are you planning? So we, Brian, uh, we have loyalty shows in Boston, two at the Burren in Somerville, which is sold, which are actually sold out. And then we're playing a city winery show also in Boston at the end of July, it looks like it's going to be, and I'll be posting about that soon. And then after, after those shows where Belly is going to focus on writing, we have a bunch of songs that we're working on right now, and we're going to make that a focus in the fall and winter, and hopefully have something in the spring. That'd be That's great. the plan. Yeah. yeah. As my last question, everybody, because I, I, I'm a huge vinyl nerd, Tanya. I, not only did I never throw my vinyl out, which is amazing because a lot of my friends did, but my father yeah. was, a, was a jazz musician and I have all his <gasps> albums. Oh my God. So I have That's all this so cool. Ver- I have, he had over like 250 jazz albums. Like oh verb my, what a treasure. My husband, Dean, is a huge jazz vinyl collector. He well, loves we'll it. have to compare notes I'll, I'll send you yeah. the list of like all the jazz and he can tell me what he has but i'm asking mm-hmm. because i think this is a fun way to end it what is a vinyl album that i should have in my collection that i probably don't but i totally should um do you have mary margaret o'hara's miss america I which do is not. very hard to find that's no, i do I not say. so why that's what a makes- tough one to find because it sounds it, it's i just feel like First of all, it's my favorite record, which may be my favorite album. It, it just, I think part of this is very personal because I just remember holding it in my hot little hands and loving it so much. It just has a warmth to, and you know, I, I, I have to confess that I'm not the audiophile that, that my husband is, but I'm just, I do tend to be, you know, I can listen to a great song on my phone and be totally satisfied <laughs> because it's a great song. That album is so warm. There's such warmth on the bottom end of it. And there's such like, it's just a few instruments and there's a lot of space in between those. I don't mean in between parts. I mean, in between the instruments simultaneously, there's just a lot of air between them. And I feel like you can hear that. 
okay. on the vinyl. Like you feel like you're in the room this is when a, you listen to it on vinyl. I mean, this is pretty oh. much a selfish question. I'm just trying to like have a cooler record collection. So you're helping <laughs> me do that. So I appreciate it. So, it's this a beautiful is, album. This has been so much fun for me. Me I, too. I, I've just enjoyed your stuff for so long and, and all oh, the different, thanks. different iterations. So Thanks. This, this was so fun. I love talking to you. That was uh, really that's sweet. If you're ever in Kansas City, let yeah. me know. I'll come out and say hi. You be safe and well, and, and uh, thanks so much for the time. All right, be well. All right, take care. Right, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Spinning in and out of hunger and hope. You always want to know how I'm doing. Tell you what, I'll tell you where. Tanya Donnelly, everybody. Again, the act is The Loyal Seas. The album is Strange Mornings in the Garden. And I think I talked about this last time, but this is true. I've, I've had the chance to listen to every track, the entire album, several times. And it's probably my favorite album of the year so far that I've had a chance to listen to. So highly recommend it. Down in the show links, it will show you how to purchase it. And, and that's how we keep live music happening it's how we keep musicians happening and afloat so uh if you if you dug today and you're a fan of tanya buy it it's not that expensive do it so that's gonna do it this week for trading fours hey you probably heard i broke my foot in fact when i was editing this i got sad listening to where i told her that i was out on a jog listening to your music because i really love jogging and i miss it but it's gonna be a while so tomorrow i get outpatient surgery on my foot Two days after that, I'm an idiot. I am still playing a live show, an acoustic show, for three hours out north at at the uh, Iron District. I will put the link there, too, if you want to come out and say hi. See me in a boot. Fuck me. Have fun. So I'm taking next week off. I'm not going to do a show next week, but two weeks from today. Nikki Bloom. Nikki Bloom. I, I had the chance to talk to her. She's also great. She also has a really good new album out. It's actually coming out in June. So from two weeks today, we're going to talk to Nikki. Until then, go out, support live music, and we'll talk real soon. Bye-bye. If we come out of this song right, Tilt that fine face high So unsteadily we go Drive the bow, drive the bow Down the low notes I feel them high